Normally, I deal exclusively with issues around health and science, but in light of recent events at Sandy Hook, I think it's time to have a serious discussion about gun control. Let me start by saying that I am an American, a Texan, and a gun owner. At the very top shelf of my closet, inside a locked gun case, I have a vintage shotgun passed down to me from my grandfather and a 22 caliber bolt-action hunting rifle that I've had since I was a boy for target shooting. I would hate to lose either gun because both have an emotional tie for me. I live in a personal gun culture here in Texas where concealed carry classes are a thriving home business, where in my youth every pickup had a rifle rack, and where hunting is more popular than soccer. When it comes to gun control, it's very hard to find any common ground. Everyone seems to have a strong opinion. Rather than my usual ranging discussion, I'm going to focus in on one issue per video. I'll be taking a look at published, peer-reviewed academic papers along the way, and presenting both sides of an issue before I offer my own commentary. Comments, as always, are completely open. Please respect that people may have different views than you, and while few people are likely to change their minds on this issue, I hope we can at least uncover what the real facts are around gun control. This first video centers on the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. I apologize to my non-U.S. viewers, but the Second Amendment is where any discussion of gun control in the U.S. has to start. The founders of our nation wrote, A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Each and every word has been scrutinized, analyzed, and written about. What does it mean by well-regulated militia? Does that mean we should only have armed troops? Why does it then say the right of the people to keep and bear arms? What did the framers intend? Let's take a quick step back to pre-Constitution legal tradition with the English Bill of Rights of 1689. Dutch Protestant King William III invaded and routed the Catholic King James II. In 1689, William met with the English Parliament and worked out a Bill of Rights that included protections against disarming Protestants. This was seen as a way of preventing future Catholic minority rule, but it also provided for equal footing in sectarian disputes, conflicts, or riots. This was important to peace and stability, since there was often no formal police force, and borders or walls were guarded by conscripts or volunteers. An armed populace was essential to keeping the peace and maintaining political stability. All of this was already common practice, but the English Bill of Rights guaranteed it to Protestants, with the proviso that the arms be suitable to their condition or degree, and such as are allowed by law. The early American states under colonial rule passed on this codified right. In Pennsylvania's Constitution of 1776, for example, we find that the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state. In fact, this practice throughout the colonies became a matter of dispute, as colonial loyalists attempted to disarm the growing patriot groups. During and after the Revolution, state militias of volunteers, with their own weapons, played an important part in tipping the balance of the war, and also in suppressing the unrest that came afterwards. There was distrust among those who fought in the Revolution of a standing army during peacetime, leading to a return to despotism. And the Americans at the time saw state militias or levies as a balance against a small, powerful, but idle professional soldier class. They feared that such a standing army could execute a coup d'etat against the legitimate government, and militias were social insurance for a fledgling government. When it became clear that the U.S. would need a federal government and a constitution, to maintain its status as an independent nation, the Constitutional Convention were split about how the document should be written. The Federalists opposed a Bill of Rights that explicitly spelled out the powers granted to the new government, and the Anti-Federalists supported it. Ultimately, they compromised on ten initial amendments. The two voices I want to focus on are James Madison, the initial author of the Bill of Rights, and Noah Webster, 
a prominent Federalist at the convention. Here first is Noah Webster. Before a standing army can rule, the people must be disarmed as they are in almost every kingdom in Europe. The supreme power in America cannot enforce unjust laws by the sword, because the whole of the people are armed and constitute a force superior to any band of regular troops that can be, on any pretense, raised in the United States. Secondly, here is James Madison in Federalist No. 28. If the representatives of the people betray their constituents, there is no resource left but an exertion of that original right of self-defense, which is paramount to all positive forms of government. The citizens must rush tumultuously to arms. So where does all this lead? Well, it leads me to conclude that for once I agree with that nut job, Alex Jones. The original intent of the framers of the U.S. Constitution was that citizens have some recourse to rebellion if their government no longer represents them as a final resort. I tell you, 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. Doesn't matter how many lemmings you get out there on the street begging for them to have their guns taken. We will not relinquish them. Do you understand? That's why you're going to fail. The Second Amendment sets up an armed populace as a balance to the power of a federal government and any large standing army they could raise. It's an understandable sentiment for a group of people who had just defeated a force of professional soldiers attempting to maintain colonial rule. Now, there are some who use the Constitution as a sort of secular scripture, something to be adhered to regardless of sense or a changing world. Others don't think it especially matters whether or not the founders intended for people to have the freedom to own machine guns or bullets that can penetrate a tactical vest. It's a living document written by some very smart people, but shouldn't override the will of the people, the rule of law, or plain common sense. I think I prefer the latter perspective on this topic. I think the Founders' wisdom doesn't give us much guidance here. And while I don't disregard it, I think we can afford to adapt. Let me describe my own reasoning, and then I'll describe the judicial positions over time on the Second Amendment. Military technology has progressed to the point where the gap between the individual or informal militia and the national military forces is simply not on the same scale. We've discovered incredible force magnifiers, and our military possess technologies forbidden to the average citizen. The idea of a private citizen militia overwhelming and defeating the U.S. military is just not realistic. For me, it's not that the framers had in mind muskets and sabers that makes their position less relevant. It's the fact that we long ago decided that a powerful standing army was essential to our role in the world. Hamilton imagined a U.S. military that was small and assembled only during wartime, but one that could be easily overwhelmed by popular opposition. I think we're way past that point now. Imagine the U.S. government decides to come for your cherished weapons. You, and a group of your like-minded friends, can stockpile all the semi-auto guns you like. You couldn't survive an onslaught from even a medium-sized town's SWAT forces. If you upgrade to illegal weaponry, purchased on the black market from foreign terrorists, you'll simply ensure that you and your entire family or group will be casualties of strategic standoff weapons launched from locations over the horizon, and the biggest challenge for the federal troops will be minimizing the blast radius so as to harm the least number of civilians. On the other hand, we do have well-regulated militias. We call them a National Guard, state troopers, police, sheriff's offices, and so on. These are the non-standing armies of armed citizenry, and they probably outnumber the active federal military, especially when local law enforcement are included. For example, the Army National Guard, since 1903, has been a shared state and federal resource. They possess advanced tactical resources and training, though focused more on domestic defense. I personally think this satisfies many of the requirements of the founders, eliminating the need for Joe Bob to own a bazooka to resist tyranny. But it doesn't address the defense of home or self, which is the application where I think there is a legitimate constitutional protection for personal gun ownership. Surprisingly, the Second Amendment 
generated little controversy for almost 100 years. A period ended with the first Supreme Court case, U.S. v. Cruikshank in 1876, which dealt with the Colfax Massacre, an armed confrontation between a mob of white militia and former slaves defending a courthouse from a takeover in the wake of a disputed state election. The court took the important position that the right to bear arms wasn't dependent on the Constitution. It was an innate human right, and the Second Amendment merely prevented Congress from interfering in that right. This principle has guided Supreme Court decisions. The right to self-defense is not a right granted, but a right possessed inherently, which may not be abridged. That principle has led the court to the modern day to side in favor of the inherent right of self-defense. However, the legal principle of self-defense has become divided into two parts, the personal right and the collective right to self-defense. The collective right involves the rights of states or actual well-organized local militia to collective protection against a tyrannical government or foreign invasion and the individual right is the one we'll wrestle with in the following videos. This is an important distinction when we begin talking about what is an acceptable and unacceptable form of weapon. I'll briefly describe one recent decision by the U.S. Supreme Court that seems especially relevant. In the case of District of Columbia v. Heller, 2008, the Supreme Court ruled that the Second Amendment expressly applies to individual rights and personal defense and therefore that laws which require guns to be stored unloaded and locked are unconstitutional. The majority opinion talks about much of what I've discussed here with regards to the intent and wording of the framers. There was also clarification that the ruling shouldn't be taken to interfere with prohibitions against machine guns, gun ownership by felons, or gun bans in sensitive areas. The dissenting opinion pointed out that if the framers had intended the Second Amendment to be about personal right, they could have spelled it out easily. Instead, they began the amendment with reference to a well-organized state militia and made no mention of hunting or self-defense. To conclude, I think the pro-gun lobby will continue to have the support of the strict constitutionalists on the Supreme Court, and I agree that the framers of the U.S. Constitution intended for an armed citizenry to be a deterrent to tyranny or military coup d'etat. However, I consider that this function of preserving liberty or collective self-defense is adequately met with non-federal troops. The issue of personal protection is a more complex issue for me. I think it's both legally protected and probably desirable that people have the right to defend themselves in their homes. But in the next video, we'll take a look at various gun control policies and their effect on violent crime and self-defense. Thanks for watching. Every cell of each plant and animal contains genetic information coded onto the DNA molecule.